Before we get into the topic for this week, forecasting and regression, we need to briefly review hypothesis testing. If you're familiar with terms like type 1 error, rejection region, and p-value, feel free to skip this module. Otherwise, you must view this short refresher. It is far from a complete discussion of the topic, but I assume you have already seen this material in some form. If so, this brief module is basically all you need to make sense of the material in the next few modules. The decision rule in all statistical tests is that if the test statistic, based on the data, is greater than the critical value, you must reject H0. It may help to think about it with this diagram. The curve shows the distribution of the test statistic, that is, the values it can take, if the null hypothesis is true. For simplicity, let's assume we are conducting a one-tailed test. As you go from left to right, the value of the test statistic increases. If the value crosses a cutoff, which is the critical value, the test statistic will lie in the rejection region. That is, it will exceed the value that you would see if the null hypothesis were true. That would be a reason for you to reject the null. The area to the left of the critical value is the acceptance region. If the test statistic was less than that critical value, it would lie in the acceptance region and you could not reject the null. The rejection region is a really, really important concept. There are a couple of things you should notice about it. One is that if the rejection region is larger, the test statistic is more likely to land in that region. Therefore, you are more likely to reject the null hypothesis. Second, the critical value determines where the rejection region begins. As the critical value increases or moves to the right in this case, the rejection region becomes smaller, so it becomes harder to reject the null. Third, the size of the rejection region or the area under that part of the curve is equal to the significance level alpha. In other words, the critical value and alpha are mirror images of each other. As the critical value increases, alpha decreases, and vice versa. Finally, remember that alpha is the probability that you will make a mistake when you reject the null hypothesis and equals 1 minus the confidence level. So if the confidence level for the test is higher, the probability alpha of making a mistake is smaller and the size of the rejection region also is smaller. Therefore, as the confidence level increases, and alpha decreases, it is harder to reject the null hypothesis. So you are more likely to reject the null hypothesis if you lower your confidence level, but you would also be more likely to make an error. In the real world, most people use an alpha of 0.05, but for your group projects, use an alpha of 0.10, as that will maximize your chances of rejecting the null hypothesis and finding a significant result. Let's put all this together. As the confidence level increases, the critical value increases, that is, moves to the right in this diagram, the value of alpha decreases and the rejection region becomes smaller. This makes it harder to reject the null hypothesis. Got that? Good. Now you're ready for the punchline. The great thing about using Excel for data analysis is that you never actually have to look up a statistical table or critical value for any type of test. Excel calculates something called a p-value, which is a benchmark that you can compare with alpha. The p-value is the probability that you will see a test statistic greater than or equal to what you calculated from the data if the null hypothesis is true. On the graph, this probability is the area to the right of the test statistic. Think about what this means. The larger the test statistic, the smaller the area on the right, which means you are less likely to see such a value if the null hypothesis is true. That is to say, the larger the test statistic, the smaller the p-value, and the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis. Therefore, you can think about the p-value intuitively as the probability that the hypothesis is correct. That is not, strictly speaking, the definition of p-value, but that's the implication. If this probability that the hypothesis is correct is low enough, you should conclude that the null hypothesis is unlikely to be true and you should reject it. But what is low enough? If there's a 30% chance that the hypothesis is true, should we reject it? What if there's a 10% chance or a 5% chance? We need a benchmark to compare with the p-value and decide when this probability is low enough. The benchmark we use is alpha, the probability of making an error. 
Just as the critical value and alpha are mirror images of each other, as we saw in the last slide, the test statistic and the p-value are mirror images of each other. We can use the decision rule if the p-value is less than alpha, reject H0. And this rule is equivalent to the decision rule we saw earlier, that if the test statistic is greater than the critical value, we reject the H0. This diagram may help you see this more clearly. The area under the curve to the right of the critical value is the rejection region, and the size of this area is alpha. Suppose the test statistic lies in the rejection region, as shown here. The area to the right of the test statistic is the p-value. Therefore, whenever the test statistic is to the right of the critical value, the p-value will be smaller than alpha, and you would reject the null hypothesis. So the two decision rules are indeed mirror images of each other, and you can use either one. In practice, looking at the p-value calculated by Excel and comparing it with alpha is all you need to do. This is much easier than looking up a table to find the critical value. If you want to know more about p-value, you can find a video about this at the link below.